Welcome to ASRM Today, a podcast that takes a deeper dive into the current topics in reproductive medicine. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Jeffrey Hayes, your host for this episode of ASRM Today. Today, I'm speaking with Dr. Harry Lehman. Dr. Lehman has been on the front lines of the COVID-19 pandemic as cases continue to grow in the United States. Dr. Lehman continues to work in the reproductive medicine space with other professionals who are looking for solutions in these perplexing times. Dr. Lehman, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Please tell us about yourself. What exactly is your specialty and where do you practice? So I am a reproductive endocrinologist and I've been practicing in the same department that I had completed my residency back in 1994. Uh, I trained in my fellowship for a few years, and then I returned uh, to join the hospital system back in 1996, and I've been there ever since. And currently, I'm a professor and full-time faculty at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in Montefiore Medical Center. Uh, I run the Division of Reproductive Endocrinology and Infertility, currently also the medical director of our fertility practice, which is based in Hartsdale. Hartsdale is in Westchester County, and it's about 15 miles north of the medical school, which is based in the Bronx. When did things begin to change due to the COVID pandemic? Well, uh, the community that I live in is New Rochelle, New York, which is a small town in Westchester. Uh, And um, March 3rd is when it began for me. Uh, What I had heard during the course of the day that someone in my community was actually admitted to a major hospital in Manhattan uh, and he had been intubated, someone that I knew well. Um, And uh, throughout the day I was hearing reports uh, that this person had been admitted to the hospital and within a couple of hours uh, I was getting notification uh, actually through social media that all the people who were living in New Rochelle as part of this community we're going to need to quarantine for at least two weeks from the time you had exposure to him. Mm-hmm. So turns out that uh, he had been, uh, this is a 400 family Orthodox observant community uh, in New Rochelle, a uh, Jewish community. Uh, and it turns out that there were three events over the weekend uh, of uh, late February uh, that this particular person had attended. And anyone who was in the synagogue building Uh, for those three events at any point in time, um, any one point in time, and they may have crossed paths with this particular individual, uh, they requested that we quarantine for two weeks from that date. So that time began for me on March 3rd, once we learned that he was positive for the COVID virus. So uh, that day was uh, kind of interesting. Everyone in the office was picking up details and they were getting little pieces of information coming through their cell phones, hearing that something was going on in my town. Um, So eventually when I received notification, I ended up packing my bags, uh, made a couple of phone calls to patients telling them that I was going to be on quarantine, called the department leadership and the department of OBGYN at the hospital and made them aware of my status and that I was leaving the practice for the next uh, about 10 days or so. So that's when it started for me. Initially, I didn't think much of it. I was going to be home. I was going to still be able to do some things for my division, but the daily routine was obviously very different than when I was used to. And and it, mm-hmm. it, it became, even though I was home and not physically at work, I think I was more exhausted just dealing with the fact that I was home. Still had some of my family members who lived in Manhattan uh, early on in this uh, pandemic and uh, was worried about them what it means for them, what's gonna to happen to school. Different things like that were just sort of taking a toll on me. Plus I had a community member who was intubated and deathly ill from this virus. So it, it was a very strange experience and uh, the quarantine began, I'm gonna say it was pretty, it was exhausting, but it, it wasn't overwhelming. It just was, okay, I'm home, a little bit different. I'll get through it. Uh, make sure I'm still keeping in touch with my patients, make sure I'm still speaking to the people in my division. My office is still functioning. I was the only one who was uh, living in in that town that had a quarantine. So everyone else was going about their business. They're still doing their egg retrievals. They're still doing all their treatments, seeing new patients. And I'm the only one who is not making it to work every day. The second week of quarantine is when things really changed. And that that's when the events even came closer to home. One of my best friends from childhood who had been telling me the whole week that he felt like he was getting, you know, some kind of flu-like symptoms. I'd been keeping in touch with him. Uh, He was also living in my neighborhood. 
and uh, unfortunately, it came down to an event on March 9th, where he actually, his wife called me and told me that uh, you got to do something about what's going on here. He's uh, really not doing well. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's, I'm very, very worried about him and he's being taken to the hospital and she got to the hospital and next thing I know he's intubated and she says, Harry, you, you got you got to do something about this. You got to take care of him. You got to get him out of here. It was a local community hospital. She knew I worked in a much larger uh, center, uh, and she said, "Do what you can do." Fortunately, I, I have some connections in the hospital system since I've been there for many many years. I was able to make the right types of phone calls, contacted the chief medical officer of the hospital, and was able to eventually, after he was stabilized in this local community hospital, was able to get him transferred into the system. Uh, and allowed him to get admitted to the main hospital center for Montefiore uh, in the Bronx. That really changed it for me, and it changed it for a few of the people. This is a very close friend, and I've known him since I was 12. And uh, this virus just took over. Uh, again, it became very personal for me at that point. Even though I knew the other gentleman well, uh, this was a completely different level, and I saw it happening to him as things progressed. He talked to me about the fact that he had malaise, he had some myalgias, he was taking his Tylenol, he was still doing some of the routine things. And then after a few hours of not speaking to him, suddenly things changed very dramatically, very rapidly. And that sort of kicked me into gear. And it kicked a lot of the guys in the neighborhood who were physicians as well. And quarantine, we were all in the same place, not necessarily doing our routine, but we felt sort of helpless here we are, and our own community is suffering. And you know, what what are we going to do about that? Are there any lessons then about healthcare that you will take forward from these experiences you're describing? Well, first, I hope it's a once in a lifetime event. Again, I, I think that second week of the quarantine, uh, when we started realizing that many, many more people were getting sick just from what appeared to be just this one person. I'm not sure if it was the one person. Most of us who live in this uh, community are obviously working professionals, work in Manhattan, going about their business. They may have had other exposures besides this particular, you know, one person who we all knew well, who happened to have been in the synagogue for those few events. But a lot of people started, you know, through the woodwork, you started hearing about someone who may have been ill. A lot of people kept it quiet. It was almost as if if you ended up coming down with it, there was something negative about you, that you did something wrong people were not very open about the fact that they had uh, this infection. Mm. Um, And it ended up becoming uh, very traumatizing as the days went on, as we heard someone else was admitted to the hospital. Uh, There's someone else who was older, who we were much more concerned about, who if they get intubated, we don't know how well they're going to do. And eventually we ended up having in the community, we ended up having, I've known personally three people uh, in the community who were intubated, Two of them were, I'm going to say, relatively young, had a lot of consequences to the, to the infection. And unfortunately for the two younger men, they ended up coming off the ventilators after two or three weeks and are now in rehab and trying to gain back their lives. Uh, but the other gentleman who was 71, also a physician, mm-hmm. unfortunately uh, succumbed to the infection and didn't get off the ventilator after four or five weeks mm-hmm. uh, and just passed away this past weekend. Mm-hmm. So... I know about two others who are also not, I'm going to say, were friends and family who uh, are a little bit more distant than that, who also older gentlemen who uh, ended up getting on a ventilator and fortunately did not survive. So out of the five people that I know, uh, two people survived and three people passed away. And that's, again, something that I, I hope we don't have to see again. There are so many unknowns still to this day even though we've seen this now for five or six weeks, so many unknowns, and one day you hear one report, uh, you can't determine if that report's going to be accurate or not. How do we go about, how do we guide the people who are asking for help? And I think this is where physicians particularly felt very helpless. People were looking for guidance from us. And not that I'm a pulmonologist and not that I'm a critical care doctor. Mm-hmm. People just were, were, were saying, what, what are we supposed to do about this? How do we gain the control? People always want to have that control. And they, just, they were just losing it. And we couldn't 
get the advice from anywhere to tell us what's going on. So I guess to go back to your question, to circle back, which is what can you gain from the whole process? And I think the Department of Health didn't have our, the answers for us. I think that's where we were concerned. The Department of Health didn't have documents ready. They heard about this infection in China, uh, but unfortunately, I don't think they were prepared for the sheer volume. Not, not just talking about testing. Testing was a whole other issue. We had a whole bunch of people in the community, hundreds of families who were stuck in their homes for two weeks, and then we were waiting for days and days and days for the Department of Health to walk into our, to our homes and make sure we got tested. And even when you call the Department of Health, the people who were responding to us on the phones who were reading a script and, and, and didn't necessarily know all the answers, and we, we were seeking answers, but no one was able to give those answers to us. So preparation uh, certainly is something that um, one would need to think about in the future. If you ask me how one prepares for this, I, I'm, I'm not sure. That, that's the hard part. And I, and I think that what we're doing today, talking about this, and it's important that people hear about you know, what happened in the, in the front lines, because as this infection or pandemic spreads across the country, other people get a sense of what it is that they potentially can do at the level of their offices, what they can do in their communities to try to help people along. And that's what I gain most from it, is, is really knowing that we have responsibilities, even though, again, I'm not the pulmonologist, I'm not the critical care doctor. I know some basic things about medicine, plus I'm also a reproductive endocrinologist. But a helping hand, information, a calm voice when people are very panicked, just to let them know that you're there with them and we, we hear what's going on. I'm a friend, I'm available to you. Those things were so important during this time frame uh, that people really were seeking us out. So what we learned as a group of physicians, again, this is not my colleagues at work. These are friends of mine who uh, play sports with, who I have uh, family life cycle events in the community, do lots of things everyone does with their neighborhood community. But these were, these were guys that I was happy to be in the front lines with. We worked endless hours together uh, writing guidance documents that we felt that the community could read as lay people because the documents that are out on the internet were very sophisticated, way too much information, how do you know what to do with the day-to-day -day routine. And the few of us started out with a group of four doctors who started screening things on the internet, looking for things to be reviewed. Um, and we just came up with a, 18 pages of our own um, mm -hmm. And then we started saying, well, look, none of us are actually critical care or pulmonologists. Uh, mm -hmm. I had a pediatric ENT, a pediatric GI doctor. I had a hematologist oncologist uh, who doesn't practice medicine right now, but we all uh, took our document and we worked on it. And then we just started passing it out to all the other community members who are physicians. And within hours, we were able to put out an 18 page guidance document at each step where people can call who do you have to speak to, what the testing is. So I found that that was the thing to learn was you had to go to your community, go to people who you can trust and work together as a group to try to bring everyone together and feel closer. And, and we felt like we did something that was positive. So that's what I learned from it. The other thing I learned after that was that once you do something like that, word spreads really, really quickly. And we were getting contacted, all of us from different places, as the virus spread to other communities, uh, I was getting contacted from people in Brooklyn, uh, other people getting contact from people in some of the northern counties, north of Westchester County, saying, we hear you have a guidance document, help us, help us, help us. And next thing you know, we're on conference calls with people who we don't even know and requesting information from us uh, just so that they can prepare their communities for the eventual infection. So learned a lot from that. And uh, it really was, it helped, I think it helped us actually get through the process just because we had so many people who we feel we touched. And that's what I think this whole thing's about. We're going to have to learn how to touch people in different ways. Uh, we're used to touching people in certain ways, unfortunately, physically. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and here we are touching people in different ways, letting them know that they're not alone. Uh, and we, if we band together, we can somehow make this work and we'll overcome you know, this issue. So that's the crux of it for me. I mean, there's a lot more to it, but I'm just saying it was really some real basic stuff.
uh, I think it got me through that initial period. What then is your outlook on the future for healthcare and reproductive care? Well, let's let's try to bring it back. I mean, I give you a lot of stuff about what we did as a community. The, the issue is also obviously what are we doing in our own field and people most for the most part, uh, I guess, want to hear about reproductive endocrinology. So my setting that I work in is is a setting that is uh, it's an academic center. Um, it's a faculty practice. So I don't own the practice. I know it's different than other centers across the country and there most places don't function the way we do uh, at this point. So I didn't make all the decisions on my own. I did have a department leadership and hospital leadership who basically said, this is what's going to happen at certain times. And I had to figure out how we're going to wind things down and, and, and close the office. My staff, because we work, work for a larger hospital system, nursing staff, medical assistants, some of the front desk staff already knew at some point, they had been hearing that there was going to be uh, some redeployment of the staff. So I knew at some point, once I was able to complete the cycles of in vitro fertilization and the artificial insemination cycles, I knew that we were going to be closing the office down. That in itself was hard. Uh, but it also, the, the staff knew that at some point they were going to be assigned to places that were in much greater need for nursing staff, particularly when uh, some of the nursing staff and the rest of the hospital system was getting sick because they were exposed to the virus through patient care. Uh, and now I have a, a number of nurses right now who are working in other uh, Montefiore uh, health uh, system uh, hospital centers just because uh, they're needed. My junior colleagues, uh, my fellows that I'm training are also uh, no longer working with us. They are now, they've been redeployed to different parts of the hospital system, taking care of patients. Some of them are in the front line. Some of them are just taking care of the general GYN patients or the OB patients that are uh, coming into the services. Again, sort of replacing people who are no longer available to uh, handle all the sick uh, healthcare workers that are, that, that are there as well. So. You know, it's been, again, exhausting, traumatizing, but again, if we work as a community and everyone steps up and does what they have to do, I, I think that we can do it. The office, though, now has to start thinking about how do we reopen? You know, going forward, how do we handle uh, this situation that we're talking about? Is this infection going to be with us going forward? If you haven't been exposed to it, do I have to worry about it down the line? Those are all great questions, and I don't know if we have any answers to those things right now. No question in New York, things seem to be slowing down, but slowing down is a relative term. As of yesterday, I think there are over five to 600 deaths in the city from the virus. It's down from a peak of about 800 or so a few days ago. So again, I, I don't know if it's gonna be something that is gonna go away in the near future, or we're gonna have to learn how to practice medicine a little bit differently. I, I think that's the, uh, you know, the, the real question is we'll be able to go back to practicing medicine the way we once did, especially in these dense areas. I can't speak necessarily to places that aren't as dense as a place like New York or Chicago, but certainly uh, in these places, we may have to practice medicine a little bit differently. And we've started to do that. I think most places uh, locally have been able to have uh, some kind of video visits. Uh, we were able to get that up and running um, a couple of weeks ago. So we now have a lot of uh, patient appointments, can't examine the patients, obviously, but we certainly can get a lot of information by speaking to patients, seeing them and making sure that they look healthy, uh, engaging in them and, as we would if they were in person with us. And when they need to come in, they can come in very well prepared and we can come in prepared, knowing that they're going to be there for a very particular reason uh, and get them into the office and out of the office. There also may be a time when we're doing more things remotely. It's a possibility that, you know, if an Apple uh, watch can now pick up my heart rhythm, um, can it take my temperature, can it take my blood pressure, uh, there are gonna be more systems that are gonna be developing over time to uh, ident that will be identified, I hope, uh, that will allow us to practice a little bit better than just seeing a person on a video chat and saying that they look pretty good to me. So that, that's a future that, again, I don't have the answers to that, but that's something that may be something down the line that we could look forward, you know, forward to. I've been speaking today with Dr. Harry Lehman. Dr. Lehman, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me, and hopefully uh, I've been able to pass on some information to help other people out across the country. Mm -hmm.